true way to see the world, which is according to biblical truth. I'll backtrack. I'm speaking Pastor Jared's notes. My name is Richard Cron, and it's my pleasure to be here. <laughs> but, okay, back to the message. Our, the worldview, our worldview is the lens which we look through to make sense of the world. It's the framework that we use to interpret what we see around us in the world. And as Christians, our lens is, our lens must be, the Word of God, the revelation of God. A core biblical conviction here is that God sent His Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. John 3.17 Jesus came, he died, he rose, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father. We see this throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New. You can look at Ephesians 1 verse 20, Mark 16, 19, Psalm 110 verse 1, Acts 7, 55 and on, and Hebrews 10 verses 12 to 14. But when this priest, who was Christ, had offered One time, for all time, one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Did you notice the detail here? Christ offered himself as the perfect sacrifice And now he sits at the right hand of God. What's next? Verse 13 says that since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. So that sounds like Christ will remain seated on his heavenly throne until something is accomplished here on earth, until all his enemies are made his footstool. And this fits with Jesus' last words to his disciples before he ascended to heaven to take his place at the right hand of the Father. In Matthew chapter 28, 18 and 20, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Therefore, in light of Christ's present reign and rule, because all authority has been given to him, therefore he sends us, we are to go evangelize the world and extend the kingdom of God. And this fits with what we saw is the mission of God earlier, to save the world both his people and the rest of his creation. And Jesus showed us how we should pray in light of his mission. And these are his words. We've prayed them often together. Matthew 6, 9 and 10. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This then is to be our perspective. It is to see His kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So, how do we understand the kingdom of God? Jesus often spoke of the kingdom. Luke 11, 20 and following. But, he says, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. He says, but when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoils. Here we see that the kingdom of God has come. It's here. Jesus has driven out demons, and Jesus is the one who is stronger. And he has stripped Satan of his armor. And Jesus now divides up the spoils. That's us. It's those of us who were being guarded in the kingdom of darkness and have now been brought into the kingdom of light. Again, this is, this is the great mission of God. This is the kingdom of God advancing. 
Remember that Jesus said that he will build his church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Perhaps you have observed or you've heard that gates don't move unless they turn on their hinges or unless they get kicked over and they fall on their nose. But the work of God, which is his church and his kingdom, is growing and it cannot be stopped. Consider Jesus' words about the kingdom of God. In Matthew 13, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it's the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a man took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. What these parables reveal is that the kingdom, of, the kingdom is something that starts small and it grows. It's not complicated. It's like one man dying on a cross like seed and after three days rising to eternal life. Or like 11 disciples waiting, waiting for the gift of the Holy Spirit, and then Jesus calling them to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth in Acts 1.8. It's a picture of us today as Christ's ambassadors spreading and splashing his kingdom wherever we go. Consider Paul in Athens bringing the kingdom of God there. It really is a fascinating study on Paul confronting and challenging the culture of the day. Culture is a word we use a lot. Do you know what it means? Reverend Joseph Boot has a definition for culture that is a whole lot shorter and I think more accurate than the one that I, I personally learned in sociology class in high school many years ago. Joseph Boot defines culture as the public manifestation of religion. What he means is that culture is formed around that which we worship. And because we all worship, either we worship the one true God or we worship something or someone else, our culture reveals our values and what we hold most dear. Paul clearly saw the culture of Athens. And we see this in Acts chapter 18. Nope, wrong, 17. Turn with me there, and we'll read from the beginning of verse 16. Acts chapter 17. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with them. And some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. 
as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Notice two things about this passage. One is Paul's interactions. Paul challenged people regardless of where they were or what their status was. He met in the synagogue and he met in the marketplace. Later, he was invited to the Areopagus. The marketplace was the public square. It was the economic, it was the political, it was the cultural center of the city. And Paul did not shy away from this location. And then Paul met with the philosophers of his day. For us now, that would be university professors and politicians, perhaps. So note, that Paul, note Paul's interactions and then note Paul's universal appeal and his challenge. In verse 30, In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Paul is addressing everyone. All people are accountable to God and therefore all are commanded to repent. Paul gives us an example to follow for confronting and engaging with our culture, engaging our culture with a kingdom culture. Allow me to close with a more recent example of a kingdom culture. William Wilberforce. Perhaps you've Heard the name. Born in England in 1759. Independently wealthy at a young age, after his parents passed away, as well as his grandfather and his favorite uncle, he was elected as a member of parliament at age 21 in the year 1780. And William embraced a worldly, sinful lifestyle. He was a gambler, and he lived the high life. But five years after he became a politician, his life changed drastically. He converted to Christ. And a mentor that spoke into his life at that time was John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, which we just sang. And John was also a former captain of slave ships. He had repented of such involvement by this time. And after his conversion in 1785, Wilberforce had initially considered leaving politics to pursue pastoral ministry. But Newton counseled him otherwise. According to Newton, he advised Wilberforce to remain in Parliament, later writing to tell him, quote, It is hoped and believed that the Lord has raised you up for the good of his church and for the good of his nation. For the good of the nation. Two years later, 1787, Wilberforce starts his campaign to abolish the African slave trade. And he was not well received by his colleagues. For the next 20 years in politics, Wilberforce suffered nothing but defeats and insults, rejection from friends, vilification from enemies, and threats to his life. His bills to abolish the slave trade that he presented to par Parliament between 1787 and 1807 were voted down 11 times, and yet he persisted. the great ending to this story from his biography. The great breakthrough came in February 1807 when at the 12th attempt the bill for abolition was carried in the House of Commons by the unexpectedly huge majority of 267 votes. As, prominent, as a prominent member of Parliament praised him for having preserved so many of his fellow creatures, Wilberforce sat amid the loud hurrahs and hear hears of his colleagues with head bowed, tears streaming down his face. After 20 years, with this victory, he had changed the course of history. And we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God has placed each of us here at this time and in this part of the world. Our responsibility is to pray and pursue and advance the kingdom of God on earth 
as it is in heaven, to change the course of history for the good of his church and for the good of our nation. Pray with me. Lord God, we're here now because you've put us here now. Thank you for your kingdom. Thank you for coming to save us and rescue us from the kingdom of darkness. Thank you that you have given us your authority to go and make disciples, to see gates and to walk through them because your authority is with us, because we're part of your kingdom and it's your kingdom, not ours. And so empower us for this, embolden us for this. May we repent of when we shy away from your mission. And so we take our part, Father, because you've given it to us and you have made us your church. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. And we all said, amen. Go in God's grace. As you go, there's one more slide, but exit with the side doors if you would as the next service comes in the center doors. God bless.